Okay, so this is uh, the end of unit two with these lessons this week. We're doing 206, 207, 208. So we'll talk about complex numbers today, operations on complex numbers today, and polynomial operations today. So we are going to go through three lessons. Uh, I want to put a lot of notes out here today and have this video up later today. So you can go back and rewatch any of it as you're working through the lessons. And if you're trying to understand something and go back and review this next week will be our test over module two. So hopefully you are keeping up. If you are uh, not finishing up module two this week, then you are behind and you definitely need to get something going there. But we're going to be uh, looking at lessons six, seven, and eight this morning. All right. So starting out uh, with lesson 2.06, uh, we have a little review on on numbers, and and this is something that I mean, ever since you were in kindergarten, you started looking at numbers, right? And we, you started out in kindergarten looking at what we call the counting numbers or the natural numbers, you know, one, two, three, four, etc. That was the first numbers that we dealt with as a young child, and then from that we added the whole numbers, and the whole numbers look a lot like the natural numbers, but we just add zero. All right, so we have the counting numbers, you know, the, the natural numbers, and then we add the whole numbers. And then from that, you expand and you add integers, which starts including the negative numbers. All right, so you had all the negatives to go with the whole numbers and the natural numbers. And then from after that, you added what's known as the rational numbers. And the rational numbers are anything that can be expressed with a fraction. Like you put one half in here. Right, you filled that gap one half over here. We had negative three halves in between negative one and negative two. We started doing all of these things that can be expressed as a fraction. So that was the rational numbers. Now, this is all rational numbers. Then we added the irrational numbers, right? Like between uh, in between here, we added the, the number pi, right? It's in between three and four, but we cannot express pi as a. a fraction so it's not a rational number it's an irrational number uh, we also added in here before the one half we added the square root of two that cannot be expressed as a fraction but it, it's an irrational number right irrational number so all of these that we looked at are known as the real number system right this is all the real numbers so we're going to expand a little bit outside of the real numbers now outside of natural numbers whole numbers integers rational numbers and irrational numbers we're going to go and talk about imaginary numbers yes there's actually something else outside of all the real numbers that we've dealt with called imaginary numbers and let me tell you what the imaginary number is that we're going to deal with it's i i is a number i is a number in mathematics and it has a value. See, we have we have a value, and it equals the square root of negative one. What? Yeah, I know. We've always said that you cannot take the square root of a negative number. So there's no answer, no solution when we get that. But now that we're expanding our knowledge and we're moving on into some higher mathematics, we can do calculations with a negative square root. And then we use the letter I in those calculations to represent that. So when we pull this out, let's say for example, we're trying to find the square root of negative 45. Before in our math, we just said no solution. 
But now we know we can break that out to square root of negative one times the square root, square root of 45. That's a positive. And then we can change this to I. So that's the same thing as I times the square root, square root of 45. And we can break down 45 to be I times the square root of 9 times the square root of 5. If we multiply all three O's together, it still equals this. But we can take the square root of 9 is 3. So we say 3I square root of 5. So this is the solution to this. If we want to know simplifying the square root of negative 45, it's 3I square root of 5. Square root of 5 is a real number. Uh, 3 is a real number, but I is imaginary. So this has an imaginary solution. It has an imaginary solution. So I equals the square root of negative 1. So with I, we can do math. We can say, all right, if we end up with an I squared, that's the square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1, which equals negative 1, right? When we take a square root of something times itself, it equals the negative 1. And then we can say I to the third power. Well, that's I squared times I, which would be negative square root of negative 1, right? So it's negative 1 times the square root of negative 1. And then we can go i to the fourth power, which is i squared times i squared. To get i to the fourth, i squared times i squared would be negative one times negative one. It's a positive one. So we deal with i, i squared, i the third, i the fourth, and the values they represent. Beyond that, when you get i to the fifth, i to the fifth is going to be the same as i to the first because it's i times i to the fourth. One times square root of negative one. So this just equals the square root of negative one because one times that could be the same thing. And we'll find out as we keep going that they all follow a pattern that they just repeat. I to the fourth is the same as I to the eighth, which is the same as I to the twelfth. This is the same as I to the eleventh. And this is the same as I to the tenth. It's the same as I to the ninth. It just keeps going. As we keep adding, we keep adding. These are the only values that we will end up with as we continue uh, raising the exponent of i. Right? So we raise the exponent of i. We will end up with these values over and over again. So if we're trying to figure out, we've said, okay, what is i to the 63rd power? Well, we can keep writing this for a long time until we get to 63. Or we really just need to know 63, how many times does 4 go into that? So if we divide that by 4, 4 goes into 6 one time. 1 times 4 is 4. Bring down the 3. 4 goes into 23 five times. So that's 20. The remainder is 3. The remainder is 3. So that means right here, this is going to equal negative square root of negative 1. Because all we have to do is look to see what is the remainder. Is it a, a 1 or 2 or 3? This is a 1, right? I, I is just I to the first power. If we have no remainder, let's say we're doing 64. So if we have 64 and we divide that by 4, that goes in there one time, 24, that goes in there six times, and there's no remainder. If there's no remainder, that puts us back to where 4 goes into it evenly, and the answer is going to be 1. So i to the 64th is just going to be 1. So we can't have a remainder of four if we're dividing by four. It's going to be a remainder of zero, right? So this is remainder one, remainder two, remainder three, remainder zero is going to put us back at one. So we can tell any power of i just by checking to see what the remainder is without having to keep writing all these. Now, if we if we have, if we struggle with this, if we get to confuse ourselves, we can always double check it by doing this continually until we get to whatever number. And we hope that number is not like two hundred and eighty-one, right? So, but that is dealing with i. So now using i. We call these complex numbers, complex. These are outside the real number system. And we can have a number like 7 plus 10i. 7 plus 10i. This is a complex number. All right? So imaginary numbers make up one part of a complex number. And the other part is a real number from our real number system. All right? So we have a real part and an imaginary part. So we always have that. And there's something called the conjugate 
the conjugate, and uh, you'll have this in your lesson. There's also a video, so watch this video over conjugate. The conjugate would be 7 minus 10i. These are a set. The conjugate is the same numbers, just using the opposite sign. Since this is plus, this is minus. If this was minus, this would be plus. So any complex number can be written as a real and an imaginary part. So we can do math with that. So let's start with just um, like this, 6 plus 8i. All right, those numbers. Plus uh, 3 plus 2i. All right, so we're doing math with complex numbers. So the coefficient is just one outside here, so we can really just do away with the parentheses, right? We don't need because there's no coefficient outside. Okay. Now, when adding complex numbers, we have to use like terms. These are both real numbers, so we can add. Whoop! That was my pencil. Six plus three, nine. All right, we have to keep real numbers together and imaginary numbers. We cannot combine those. So 8i and 2i are imaginary numbers. So we have 9 plus 10i, and that's as far as we can go. This is not 19i. These are different. This is a real number. This is an imaginary number. We have to keep the imaginary numbers separate from the real numbers because they are different. They are different. So... We can do math at this. How about when we subtract? Let's try this one. Uh, 1 minus 4i minus, we're going to say, 6 plus 9i. All right, if anyone's got some pencil and paper there, I'm going to give you a chance to answer this before I do it. So look at that. Type it in the chat if you can figure out what is 1 minus 4i minus 6 plus 9i. See if you get this. You got you got to distribute. We do have a something besides a one out in front of that. We're subtracting. See if you can put the answer in the chat. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start it slowly here. So this is just the coefficient of one out here. So this is just one minus four i. Here we have a negative subtracting so if we could distribute this negative one it's really a negative one minus six and minus nine i okay negative five minus 13 i somebody's a, somebody's got the answer so again we have to keep the real numbers together one minus six is negative five uh, you guys are doing great negative four i and negative nine these are both imaginary so we can combine those Negative 5 minus 13i. I know you, some of you guys jumped into the chat and got that one. Great job. Got to keep that imagination. So let's, let's talk about using that to solve uh, something that we might see like this. If we had the square root of negative 12 times the square root of negative 5. All right. Now, before we knew about imaginary numbers, we might... Just say, oh, well, that's the same as the square root of 60, right? When I multiply those together and I still keep them under there. If I do this, I'm going to mess up my answer because, let's see, 60, let's see, that's the same thing as the square root of 4 times the square root of 15. And I square root of 4 is 2, so I got 2 square roots of 15. That's what I would put as an answer. But there's a problem. These are both imaginary numbers. There's no such number as... The square root of negative 12 or the square root of negative 5 in the real number system. This is a real number answer. This is a real number answer. So there's a problem. We have to rewrite these first as the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 12 times the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 5. I'm separating out the imaginary and real parts. If I multiply those back together, it is the square root of negative 12. So now I've got this twice. So I have the square root of negative 1 squared. And then I have square root of 12 times 5, which is 60. Separating those out. All right, square root of 12 times the square root of 5 is the square root of 60. Now, 
we'll take the square root and then square it. That leaves us with just negative one. Square root of 60 is the square root of four times the square root of 15. We can write it in a different way. We can know five and 12, we can change it to four and 15. We want the four and 15 because we can take the square root of four to be two. So we got negative two square root of 15. Little bit different. This one's correct. This one, we lost that negative one that came from the I squared. Right, it came, this is I and this is I, so that's really, it's I squared. I squared equals negative one. We lost that negative one and we got the wrong answer. So when you're dealing with this, pull those negatives out. Pull out those I's, right? Because it's, it's really, this is I times the square root of 12 and I times the square root of five. So don't lose those. All right, let me give another one for you to try and put in the chat. We're going to go to 6 minus 3i times 5 plus 9i. Let's see if you can get this. This deals with uh, the distributive property, right? you got to distribute. you got to distribute. And we'll see if you can get this one. I'm going to start giving you a few hints. And the 6 has to be distributed to everything in the second parentheses and then you have to come back and you got to have the negative 3i and you got to distribute that all right so don't forget we got to distribute to every term and then we have to distribute the second term to every term all right i'm working slow giving you a chance to get ahead of me hopefully you'll have this answer before i get there so let me see if i distribute six times five Six times five is 30. I see some of you guys working. Six times nine I. So six times nine is 54 I, right? I is not a variable, by the way. I is a number. It's an imaginary number. But we kind of treat it like a variable when we look at like terms, like terms, but it's not a variable. Okay, I'm done with the six. I've distributed the six to both of those. I'm watching the chat, see if anybody gets this. Negative 3i times 5. So I've got negative 15i, right? Because I distributed that negative 3i. And then negative 3i times 9i times positive 9i. So what is negative 3i times positive i? Well, negative 3 times positive 9 is negative 27. And i times i. So I've got negative 27i squared on the end. Nope, I don't see anyone have an answer yet. Let's slow down a little bit. Wait and see an answer pop up. Oh, there's an answer. Close. Or our like terms. Now we can combine the two i terms like terms so now we've got 30 plus 54i and minus 15i it still leaves a positive 39i minus 27i squared we're not done yet we're getting close 27i squared we can simplify that right so negative 27i squared well, we said i squared was the same thing as the square root of negative 1 squared, which means it equals negative 1. So this is the same as negative 27 times negative 1, because i squared is negative 1. So negative 27 times negative 1 is a positive 27. So now this simplifies to 30 plus 39i plus 27. These are like terms, right? They're just both constants. So now we've got 57 plus 39i, and that's our final answer. Can't do anything more with that. 57 plus 39i. You got to watch these things. When the i squared comes in there, we can convert that to an actual constant, a number, a real number now. 
because I squared brings it back into the real number system. That's when we use imaginary numbers to do real math. And and when imaginary number, when the imaginary number I was first introduced um, 300 years ago, they decided that you could use it in math as long as it was gone by the time you got your final answer. They would not allow an answer that had an I in it. So as long as you could get it to be a squared number or to the fourth power or some number that the I would go away, it was acceptable in the math community to use I in your calculations. Later on, we decided that having an imaginary answer is okay because our technology increased. We could actually graph these points. Now, it's more of a three-dimensional graph, but we can graph imaginary numbers now, and we've expanded our thinking in mathematic world to include imaginary answers. But originally, you had to have the I mathematically eliminated by the time you got there. But it was useful in some of our math calculations to be able to use that. So, all right, let's continue on. We're going to talk about uh, polynomial operations. This is 2.08. So uh, 2.06 this week is, is introducing imaginary numbers and talking about what they equal up here. 2.07 gets into using them in, in calculations like we're doing there. And so we're going to go to 2.08, talks about polynomial operations. And it kind of gets out of the imaginary numbers a little bit. But we're going to talk about uh, what to do when you have two different functions. And we've dealt with functions already. This is... Uh, continuing on to that. So if this equals 7x squared plus 3x minus 5, and this one equals 2x squared minus 4x plus 9, all right, so we have two different functions. And I say I want f plus g of x. I just saying add those two functions together. Take f of x and g of x and make it f plus g of x. So that's just saying take 7x squared plus 3x minus 5, which is the first function, and add it to 2x squared minus 4x plus 9. Add those together. All right, so when we add those together, this is just coefficient of 1, so we don't need the parentheses. So we can add like terms. x squareds can be put together with other x squareds. We cannot... Combine them with the x's or with the constants. So if we're adding 7 plus 2 is 9, we have 9x squared. And now we have the 3x and the negative 4x. Those are like terms. They're both x's. So positive 3 minus 4, that's just a minus 1x. So we can just say minus x. And then we've got a negative 5 and a positive 9. So that is the answer. When we add f of x and g of x together, this is our solution. Okay, it's, it's all about like terms. Now let's do this. Let's say f minus g of x. f minus g of x. Okay, well, we start out the same way. 7x squared plus 3x minus 5, except we're going to subtract instead of add. subtracting which means this is like having a negative one coefficient so if we want to distribute that nothing happens up here because this is a positive one we can distribute this negative 2x squared negative 1 times negative 4x is a positive 4x negative 1 times 9 is negative 9 now we just combine like terms again we have our x squared terms we have a 7 and a negative 2 this time, so we have a 5x squared. We have a positive 3 and a positive 4. We have a 7x. We have a negative 5 and a negative 9, negative 14. So we can subtract, just like we can add two functions, f plus g of x, f minus g of x. Or maybe I just give you the problem like this and say, okay, subtract these two functions from each other. But this is what we're doing, right? We're taking one function and subtracting it from the other function. Something else that you'll see in this lesson is fg of x, right? This is multiplying fg. And I'm going to give you two different functions. We're not going to do a, two trinomials. We'll do a trinomial and a binomial. So in this case, let's say f of x equals 4x 
squared minus 5x plus 9. And then our g of x equals x minus 5. x minus 5. So if we take fg of x, that means we're going to multiply these together. We're going to multiply these together. So we have to take the first term, 4x squared, and multiply it by both of those terms, right? So 4x squared times x is 4x to the third, because x squared times another x is now x to the third. Then we take the 4x, we multiply it, 4x squared times the negative 5. So now we have negative 20x squared. Okay, now we have to go to the second term and distribute it to both of those terms. So negative 5x times x is negative 5x squared. And negative 5x times negative 5, negative 25x. Okay, we've done that one. Now we've got to distribute the 9. 9 times x is 9x. Nine, 9 times negative 5, negative 45. Okay, we've done all the multiplication. Now it's just identifying like terms and simplifying. Uh, 4x to the third. That's the only x to the third. It's the only one. So it just stays by itself. We have two x squared terms. So it's negative 25x squared. We have two x terms, negative 25 and positive 9. So negative 16x. And then we only have one constant. So that is our answer. That's as simple as we can do that. We can't do anything else with that. All right, so what else do we have in here? Uh, function notation, you know, this is function notation. We've, it shouldn't be a totally new thing. It's just like y equals, but f of x equals is function notation. Uh, the vertical line test, you know, to make something a function, it has to have only one y for each x, which means if we have a graph, if we, we have the vertical line test. If I graph a function and, and the graph looks like this, all right, it's not linear, it's something different. The vertical line test say if I make a line straight up and down and I make a bunch of straight up and down lines, nowhere should that line touch the graph twice if it's a function. Nowhere did it touch it twice. So that is a function. However, if I have a different graph over here and my graph does this, I have a place that if I made a straight up and down line, I would touch that graph more than once. So this is not a function, not a function. This one is a function. All right, function, not a function. Vertical line test. Don't forget your vertical line test when you have a graph to tell something's a function. Um, Let's see, what else can we talk about? Oh, oh, we have one other thing on this. Let's just get into that. Am I getting ahead of it? Let's not do anything beyond it. Okay. Another thing I want to talk about is inverses and inverse. So when we talk about the inverse of something, um, that means performing an operation will cancel that number, right? So if we have addition like seven, we can add a negative 7 to it, and that will cancel out that number. Or if multiplying, uh, if that, we're going to multiply, we multiply by 1 over 7, and that is the inverse of 7. Right? This is this canceled out the 7 made it uh, 1 over 7, an inverse. So with functions, f of x equals 3x minus 5, we can find the inverse of this function. And the way we do that is we rewrite it as a y equals. Okay, I just took it out of function notation, put it back as a y equals. It's the same thing though, right? f of x is the same as y. And then I'm going to take these two variables, and we're going to take the x and the y, and we're going to trade places. They're going to trade places with each other. So now it's going to be x equals 3y minus 5. All right. Now I want to get this back as a y equals. Add 5. Remember, if we have a, a constant and a variable, we cannot combine them. It's just x plus 5 at that point. 
equals 3y. I'm trying to get y by itself. So y equals x plus 5 divided by 3. So this is the inverse of this. If this is our function, this is how we write inverse. We put a little negative 1 up here as a superscript. It's not an exponent. We're not taking the function to the power of negative 1. This is how we do notation, function notation. Here's the function. This is the inverse function, and it's going to be x plus 5 divided by 3. So this is the inverse of the original function. Okay, if I have calculated the inverse and I want to know if I've done it correctly, I can graph that. So let me graph the original, y equals 3x minus 5. All right, so there's the graph of our original function. And then I'm going to graph the inverse function, y equals, and I need to put this in parentheses because the x plus 5 all is on top, oh, plus 5 x plus 5 is all supposed to be on top of the fraction. So I have to use parentheses or I won't do that correctly. And on the bottom is 3. So x plus 5 divided by 3. Okay, that was our function. That was our inverse function. And here's the graphs of those two functions. Now, there's something that will always be true of an inverse of a function. If you take that diagonal line where y equals x, y equals the x, it's that diagonal green line right there. This is a reflection over that diagonal line y equals x. An inverse, the graph of the inverse function will be a reflection over y equals x. And here, you know, that's that's an interesting thing about that. If we look at this point here, if the point oops, 613 is on this line, then we can take the y equals x and 13, 6 will be on the other line. Just switch those two. So we go over here at the point. Well, where's that? There it is, 13, 6. Because the y equals x, that's the what we reflected over, which means the y and the x trade places. That's what we did with the inverse. So 13, 6 exists. That means 6, 13 exists. They both will be on the graph of the function and its inverse. Let's look at um, x squared plus 5 as our function. And let's have another function, g of x equals uh what do we want to do with this one i'm going to call it 8x and i say i want to know this oh that looks different this is not f plus g or f minus g it's not even f times g look what's going on normally we have f of x and we say well we're going to substitute something in for x so maybe we want to say if f is 2 We'll say, I'm going to check it when f is 2, and that would be you know, f of 2. Well, this is f of g of x. I am taking g of x and substituting it in for this x. That's what I put inside that parentheses. So that means instead of x, I'm going to have 8x squared plus 5. So on this one, I would make it 2 squared plus 5. And it would equal 4 plus 5, or 9, right? On this, I'm substituting 8x in there. So 8x squared is 64x squared plus 5. And that's as simple as it gets. I can't simplify that any further. But that's f of g of x. So whatever's inside the parentheses is what you're substituting in for x, whether it's a 2 or whether it's another function. We can also do g of f of x. So I'm taking f of x and I'm substituting it in for g. So that would be 8. Instead of 8x, I'm substituting this in, x squared plus 5, into the g of x. So simplifying that, I have to distribute 8x squared plus 40. Notice they're not the same. g of f of x is different than f of g of x. But that's what you're doing when you see something inside the parentheses. What are you substituting in? Well, I'm substituting another function in instead of substituting in a number for x. 
Okay, guys, if you have questions on this, bring them to class next time. Uh, bring them to class on Thursday. I am out this Friday, so if you need me on Friday, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I'm out of town all day. I have medical appointments. I will not be here. But email me if you have trouble with any of this. Remember, this is the last of Module 2. We'll be taking tests next week. So I will let you guys go. If you got questions, hang around. Have a great week. Let's get out of here. Word to your moment. Mouth, mouth, baby.